I think I told you guys about the time that I got a flat tire out in, oh, I don't know, out towards Westfield. Robin had to ride home by herself, get the car and come get me. So I killed time in the cemetery and looking at all the gravestones. And there was one guy in like 1880s or something, really elaborate, nicely done. And the key thing was William whatever, I don't even know what his name was. And it says, gone but not forgotten. And I'm like, <laughs> not true. <laughs> You're totally forgotten. <laughs> and then you apply it to yourself. And so when I do this stuff, I'm like, yeah, you know, it was all great. But, um, but like your grandmother or whatever, it just fades out. But that's what small lives get. Northampton is a small college city in Western Massachusetts. From its settlement by Europeans in the 17th century, through its rapid rise as a mill town and participation in the Underground Railroad, the city has prided itself on its close-knit community. However, political partisanship, social media, and COVID have reshaped the social landscape as we once knew it, even in a place like Northampton. Despite this trajectory, there are still a handful of individuals who make a difference in strengthening the local community. Jim Myas moved from Worcester to Northampton in the 70s after dropping out of college. Shortly after moving, he got a job at the VA and met his future wife, Robin. He fell in love with the area and has lived there ever since. The Connecticut River looked awesome to me as a kid coming out of Worcester. And it is awesome. I mean, it splits New England right down the middle, right? 415 miles. And then you got those Seven Sisters mountain range running the exact opposite way. And so geographically, there was something that definitely appealed to me. Coaching, I started when my son Seth was, I want to say he's nine. He had these terrible coaches. They were like always talking to themselves and always lecturing the kids, sitting them down and stuff. And I was just like, will you let these kids play? And so I thought, if I'm going to criticize, I might as well coach. You asked me what my first Little League experience was. I mean, I had a great time in Little League, don't get me wrong. But the baseball I really loved, and the baseball that was the most important to all of us in our neighborhood, no matter what the skill level was, was our own pickup baseball in our neighborhoods. And that was what was really fun. So coming off of a Worcester upbringing where I knew baseball could be fun and stuff, the joy of it was like gone for these kids, I felt like when I watched that. I was like, well, just do something about it. And so. I just knew I liked it right away because of what I learned as a kid playing with my buddies. If I liked it back then as a kid, I knew all my buddies liked it that way, then why wouldn't everyone like it that way? So we had to close Little League down early, as fun as it was, because we had to accommodate all stars. So all of Little League had to stop by like June 20th or something. When the weather finally gets good, finally things dry out, and we have to stop so all stars can play. So 14 kids get to play on further. What, 150 kids, season's over, right? It was crazy. I just couldn't see it, you know? So I just said, I'm gonna play three days a week. It was so organic. It was schoolyardy. Kids learned to swear there a little more. There was no one telling you to tuck your shirt in. All this stuff that happened was not my invention. It was all you guys' invention. You guys would take it to this whole other thing, you know? I was like watching live freaking theater. I mean, there wouldn't be a professional baseball game I would want to go to. Some of the plays were fantastic, and some of the things that would happen were like insane, like 
quadruple plays. I think there was a quadruple play once. And I think there were things like balls bouncing off a kid's heads and then into someone's glove and then some bizarro. You know, so there was always all that going on too. So it was like theater. When I was doing summer ball or any of that stuff, Little League, I just saw all the kids grow well. What else could you possibly ask for? Because, you know, you're just a little step along the way to life. I always used a bike. As a kid, a bike was essential then, you know? Robin and Seth bought me a single one-speed beach cruiser bike 35 years ago or whatever. And I don't know what happened with that bike, man. It cast some power over me. Next thing I know, I'm riding it more and more and more and more. And Robin and I met based on bicycle riding. We would go for rides together. So biking was huge for Robin and I's relationship. When we were first going out biking, I had this one mountain bike that someone had given me. And, um, it would, I could only go like 25 miles because it was so, it was a heavy bike and the tires were big. And there were times that he would say, we'll go up this way, we'll go up that way. And it wind up in this big hill. And I said, I'm never going on another bike ride with you again. I could drive Robin <laughs> crazy. Robin is really a great companion with bicycle. Mine in the middle became crazy when they gave me that freaking one speed. Not only was I riding with Robin all the time, but then I got crazy on my own riding, and I started riding a Mount Greylock and here and there, and I don't know where the hell all the energy came, but it was that freedom of that one-speed bike that I was loving. I would probably ride just on a regular day about 10 miles, just doing whatever I'm doing, right? Whatever people do in a car, I'm doing. Right now, I'm probably doing about 8,000 8, miles a year, 9,000 miles a year. It's kind of like having a bowel movement or having your meals or whatever, you know. It's just part of the day, man. I love it. On my bike is awesome when you talk about feeling like sense of community. I'm always running into people wherever I am. So I feel very at home when I go out into the community, like doop de doop de doop. This is just my community. And then someone reinforces that. <laughs> hey Tony, how you doing? I'm good. Hey, how you doing? Hi Elena. How you doing? You know Tracy? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hear she's moving. She um, totally loves cool. your window displays. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I leave Robin at the end of the story, too, but she was really rock solid, you know, where I would have been a hobo and wandered around. I also met Robin. Jim and I have a lot in common, but we're very different and more practical. And he's like a little fly-by-night. And you're private. You're more private. Yeah, I'm private. Uh, I think we just really kind of uh, worked so that we go together. You know, like I was here, he's there, and we just kind of blended a little bit more together. Robin was down to earth, and she had her Lisa. And Lisa was only like three, so, you know, I, was got, I had to get serious about something. So I got a full-time job in the library. Um, and um, there I pretty much stayed the whole time. We had two huge libraries, big budgets. Well attended too, very well attended. It was a blast with those guys. Old, grizzly AA guys, drug guys, schizophrenic guys who would be your friend one moment and then like curse you out the next. <laughs> and then guys you get to know for years and years and years, you know, that lived at that hospital. That was a real community. When you talk about community, you know, where it's going, that was another one that probably is why it makes me sad about community. That had 800 patients at one time, and I think it has 50 now. It was a real community up there. 
It was great. Patients came in all the time. <clears throat> now I don't know where those guys would go. They go to nursing homes, do they go to community houses? I don't know where they go, but I don't know that it's much better. Leads me dark a little bit. You know, I just think people, are not, they don't seem to be doing the one-on-one -on -one thing. Have you seen a human being walk by in the last, like, like, it's not that bad out. It's nice, you know? I find everyone's in their house now, so it doesn't seem to be the same sense of community. They go from house to car to event, house to car to event, house to car to work, of course, or stay in the house. Ah, it seems to be getting creepy to me. The things that ended summer ball, partially my age, real bone of contention. Kids devote themselves to only one sport. So they go to all these special, or they're on special teams. So they're playing soccer all year. I'd get like 12, maybe I'd get eight kids from a high of 45 or 50. And it was still, I was doing the same thing. Nothing different, not advertising, but the word was out there, people knew, you know. It just was getting sadder. I really saw it as society changing. You know, Little League was losing traction. Things were getting very professionalized in all kids' lives, wicked scheduled. It just didn't seem to resonate anymore. And so it just kind of came to an end where I just couldn't do it. So that was the kind of a sad last year, I think. It made me, it definitely made me feel bit, uh, bad, but we hit such a high point there for a while. And I knew it was going to be the end of sort of the way youth sports go. Not to be a downer on it though, it was worth every freaking minute of it, you know? And, um, and it might change, who knows? I don't know, I don't think so. I think life is getting more complicated. I know Jim Myers from playing summer ball and playing Little League Baseball in Northampton, Massachusetts. I know Jim from having moved into a house across the street from his. I know Jim Myers from growing up in Florence and playing summer ball. You see him all over town on his bike. Uh, he's a big part of the community. You know, he could go out and buy a, a nice car or anything like that, but he's on his bike with his little milk box crate. I always describe Jim as like a legend, like <laughs> he's one of the most influential people in Northampton, I feel like. He's incredibly outgoing and in many ways childlike in the best sense of, of that word. Doing an activity with him was just a way to uh, brighten like a person's day or brighten your own day. I know there's a lot of people with troubled youth, including myself, who for a few hours, three times a week, you can hang out with a bunch of guys your age, a little older, a little younger, and play America's pastime. You know, he could have been with his kids, he could have been doing stuff with his wife, but he was here giving time to the community. He's just affected everyone in small ways. The little kids, old people, homeless people. Jim's always there to just help and lend a smile or the shirt off his back. He makes you feel like you're home, like you are the center of the universe in that moment and somehow he captures and he remembers who you are, what you do, and remembers everybody's name. Jim Myas has definitely made a really big impact on my life as a teacher. He's shown me that like a good leader and a good like teacher listens, cares about the people who are you are around. When we grow up and have kids, like we wanna be able to teach them kind of the way Jim taught us. It's definitely inspired me to somehow give back to the community, uh, even if it's just, yeah, bringing kids together on the weekends. If there were more people like Jim Myers, this world would be in a very different place.
I'm totally happy and content. You know, I really lucked out. I don't think I'd merit any more than this. Whoever's out there, if there is someone out there or whatever, I'm like, I don't know how that happens, but you have my utmost thanks, but I don't know <laughs> if that's even enough. <laughs> and then kind of ride with it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, so. So is it too long-winded? Is it right? <laughs>